Last night, I finally got a chance to see the My Hero Academia movie, Heroes Rising. And I loved it. I really did. And uh, today, we're going to go through a quick recap, a uh, review, of course, my more detailed thoughts, and then a discussion that will have some spoilers for anime onlys, but that'll be at the very, very end. I will give you guys a warning for that, but I will let you know that the movie does have spoilers for you guys as well, and there are some characters that you haven't seen yet. There are some abilities you haven't seen yet, so when you do see the movie, be with caution, but luckily, it's not so in your face that as long as you're a casual anime only, you will enjoy it without even realizing half the stuff being spoiled in front of you. You literally will not realize it. But for the not-so-casual anime onlys who, you know, break down every character, quirk limit, you guys will be heavily spoiled, actually. First off, the uh, kids of Class 1A have been taken to Nabu Island? Nabu Island. And there are no pro heroes on it. There is a hint that there was an older pro hero, but it seems he passed away at some point. But that's never brought up again. Either way, they're brought onto the island, and there is an opening montage of all of them doing hero work, whether it's working at a beach, which is actually very good. It gives a lot of spotlight to some of the students that you guys wouldn't even think to really look at, not even just like ones that are known for like quirks and perviness like Minetta, but other ones like Sato and Saro, names that I honestly half forgot prior to the opening, but still... Yeah, it's definitely a very fun opening. And things get a little weird. Uh, the very, very opening, right before this, actually, I shouldn't have skipped. The League of Villains are transporting someone in a uh, Bacta tube. Someone that the Doctor had worked on. Now, some, like I said, anime only, you won't know who the Doctor is, but that's just what you do. The Doctor has made certain modifications that we learn about later on the movie to this character called Nine. And the League of Villains, who actually still have no idea what they're transporting, they are, and they fight against uh, Endeavor and a few other heroes. I'm not entirely sure what their names were, but it's pretty one-sided until they hit Endeavor. And when Endeavor finally does stop them, it's revealed that the League of Villains is not there. I won't go into too much detail, because this is also a manga spoiler. But going on to that, the League of Villains escape, and Nine escapes. And he proceeds to hunt down people with specific quirks. At first it's just heroes, but then he hunts down a normal civilian with a cell activation quirk. And this cell activation quirk, unfortunately for him, only works on people with the A blood type. Now, going back to Nabu Island, there are these two kids who kind of prank call our protagonists. And one of them, Mahoro, or was it Mahoro? Mahoro. She, she berates Deku for taking an hour to find a child that she was honestly right next to the whole damn time anyway, making the whole call pointless. Basically, she doesn't like heroes because she wants to protect her brother who wants to be a hero, whose quirk is not offensively based. However, his quirk, spoil, not spoilers, but surprise, surprise, is the cell activation quirk that works for the blood type B, which is exactly what the hero needs. And yeah, that civilian who lost his quirk was the father of the two kids. On that note, Nine can steal up to nine quirks, or at least hold up to nine quirks. Not sure if this involves his original one of weather manipulation or not, but in the end, he does have a lot of quirks. And technically speaking, unless he found a way to discard it, he does have the father's quirk as well. But he never uses it again for obvious reasons. But... His quirks we'll get into a little bit later. Either way, Nine and his three henchmen, Razor, uh, Mummy, and Kamara. No, Slice Mummy and Kamara. My apologies. So those three make their way to Nabu Island, and they do have show-offs with each of the kids. And 
and uh, maybe I should go more in depth. Maybe I should skim over it. But Bakugo takes on Mummy and pretty much takes him out pretty quickly. It's actually in the uh, fights that a lot of the lesser known Class 1A members take place. Uh, Shoji, I believe it was, he managed to take on Kamara, who, when it comes to strict power, he was by far the strongest of the uh, three henchmen, but uh, seemingly the strongest and one of the most unorthodox. Uh, Kamara, he was basically like a dog with a lizard tail and some feathers and some you know, talons, and he could breathe fire. Pretty terrifying, actually. He mostly saved the fire breath from when Todoroki came, but Shoji managed to actually hold on his own for a long time. Normally, characters who don't get much screen time, such as him, don't exactly get a lot, and most of you probably would have expected him to, uh, you know, freaking get knocked the fuck out and then cut away from the thing and go back to the fight and he's just being held unconsciously. No, he's still fighting even a little bit past the uh, re reinforcements coming. So Ida, Todoroki, uh, I forget some of the other names, I'm sorry. Like I said, because they're not usually given spotlight, a lot of these names way, way surpass me. But I did learn a few more thanks to this movie. So like I said, one thing I love about this movie, I will get more into it in detail later, but it really shows a spotlight for all of them. Either way, you know, Kamara, he, they don't win against Kamara. In fact, Mummy is the only one they manage to take down. Slice doesn't even get her own 1v1 or Team V her. And in the end, she's kind of just mostly on the side and uh, it's actually nine who gets a really big fight early on he finds katsuma which is the boy with the cell b activation quirk a type b activation quirk and his sister mahora they kind of try to defend themselves with mahora's illusions which doesn't work he knows it's an illusion one of his quirks is to be able to scan the quirks of others so there's what was it two or three right there I'm not going to try and count all of them, because in the end they are confusing, and two of them kind of seem similar with his weather manipulation quirk and a supposable gust of wind that cuts Deku, which I'm getting to in a second. Deku does manage to come just in time to at least stop him from getting the kids, but it doesn't work out that well, because Deku, Deku, he nearly gets his butt whooped, and then Nine tries to steal his quirk. Now, I, like I said, this is a bit of a spoiler for anime onlys. I'm not going to say what it is, but there is a reason he cannot steal Deku's quirk, and he does touch upon it in the movie. So, be aware when you go into the movie that this particular part is a huge, huge manga spoiler. But I'm going to skim over that for you guys. Like I said, I'm not going to really delve into manga spoilers until the end of the video, which I will then let you know. But even so, beware when you're going to the movie. In the end, he does manage to get his ass handed to him until Bakugo comes in to save him. And even then, they do get a little bit overwhelmed with the number of quirks. But by the time they've fought to a surprising stalemate, they're near dead, but unfortunately for Nine, he can't go on any longer because he needs a cell activation quirk. Now, I didn't mention it when I went over his uh, surgeries and you know stuff earlier, but despite having so much power, his body is really weak and his cells cannot really handle it. He went to the League of Villains to get the surgery in hopes that it would enhance his uh, powers and, you know, Enhance his body's ability to take care of them. Ironically, it did the opposite. His body breaks down even faster. So he needs the type B cell activation quirk, not just for nefarious purposes. He needs it to strengthen himself so he can always use his OP abilities. So he is, he is basically OP, but he doesn't use all of his power at the same time because it would pretty much freaking kill him. Spoiler alert, he doesn't really care after a while, but that's not till the final battle. Either way, we go on, and 
the fight luckily does get some spotlight. Some of the other kids who don't do much manage to uh, support everybody. And then later, Katsuma, he actually heals Bakugo and uh, Deku, who are, I'm assuming, type B blood. That actually makes a lot of sense for a later plot point if they're the same blood type. I'm not going to get into that yet. That's more of a rant. But, nonetheless, they go on. They make a plan. Mummy is also still incarcerated, and he stays incarcerated. It's not like a breakout scene or anything. If it was a full arc, he would have broken out, and then they would have had to fight his ass again. But he's all you know tied up and watched. So, good. That's one down for real. So, they all move to a center island after they f all figure out that Katsuma is exactly who they're targeting, because Deku was unconscious when everyone was making the initial plans. They split all of them up. Kamara takes on Todoroki, Ida, and uh, Kishirma. I really messed up his name. Red Riot is his hero name, if you guys know what I'm talking about. And uh, Frog Girl, whose name I occasionally forget, and I'm sorry... I love her, but I can't remember her name. Uh, so he takes on the four of them, and they actually have a pretty good idea at first, which ends in failure, or semi-failure, until he transforms and whoops their asses for the time being. They do make a comeback, though, with uh, everyone else distracting him with uh, Red Riot taking on his upgraded fire laser beams? I don't know. But luckily, Todoroki managed to get in and freeze him from the inside, which does not kill him somehow. That's one thing I actually have a, a little bit against, like, movies and stuff or my heroes, that you can't kill anybody. Or at least the heroes can't, wink, wink. But, no, uh, all jokes aside, it was still an epic fight. Uh, Slice, well, I almost called Razor again, she takes on uh, Poison Girl, whose name I also forget. Why do I keep forgetting names? Because there's 20 of them. That's why. Either way, she and... Uh, huh. Sukiyomi? Yeah, I think that's his name. Bird Boy. Shadow Bird Boy. They take him on... Her on... I mean, and again, well, it's 2020, am I assuming her gender? All jokes aside, they take her on in a little bit less of a focus battle, but they use acid on her hair, which is her main ability, making razor hair like she's a thin human girl from Marvel, but sharper. And it works for the most part. It really does. But, uh, still, even so, you gotta be careful with that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it, it does come to what seems like a stalemate, and it looks like a tie when it's all over. Now, getting to nine, this is the part that really, really, really got me. So initially, there was... It's a kind of a three-parter, actually, to be honest. Part one is nine versus Araka, Saro, and Mineta. First, it's just Araka and, and uh, Saro... And Sarah was one of the ones that I honestly totally forget about usually. But he looked so badass in this part. Like, seriously. I hope that he gets some focus in some of the next future arcs. Because he was amazing. Still failed for the most part. But their, their plan was not to defeat him outright. Or at least uh, at first. It was to make him use his quirk so that he tires out and kind of just faints. And, I mean, I'm not going to lie, they kind of do lose sight of that plan after a little while, but that's not to, like, the final phase of the battle, where it gets all DBZ-like. But, in the end, like I said, it was absolutely amazing. It was beautiful planning. Araka and Saro were basically working together with Araka. Or Araka, I guess. I, yeah. I forgot a syllable. She basically used... Whatchamacallit? Uh, what's the word? She used her quirk to lighten up the boulders and stuff. And then Sarah would use his tape to toss them at her. And despite it sounding so simple, I have to give the movie props for really making it shine and pop. And 
Mineta's involvement a little bit later was a little bit more just keeping the rocks on top of him, you know, throw a few sticky balls of grape scalp in between until, you know, everything's all said and done. But, nonetheless, it didn't seemingly do much. He blasted the living hell out of all three of them. Didn't take Araka and Sero completely out. Bakugo and Deku do come in and start fighting him. And when things look a little dire, Sero and Araka do actually come back in for a few hits, which knocks them out completely for the rest of the movie. But they did an amazing job nonetheless. I'm so proud of them, and I'm glad the movie put such a good emphasis on them, especially Sarah. Uraka's best girl, but Sarah is someone who doesn't get spotlight like that. So that's great for him, and I'm happy for him. Now on to... Well, I don't want to skip the middle part of the fight. It's more he takes out Bakugo and Deku for a little bit, but it's kind of a fake out. Luckily, they use another member's quirk to uh, as a lightning rod, so they don't get hit by the full brunt of his lightning. But while they are at least slightly recuperating, uh, what was it Jiro and Shoji take on Nine, or at least try to stall him. And while well, shoot, I forget the other one's name, the one with a couple arms and the mask. I really have to look his name up later. But either way, they did an amazing job playing keep away long enough for Deku and Bakugo to come back into the fray and whoop Nine's ass until he goes overboard. And they basically have to share blood. Now, this is a little bit of a contention with me, and that is the fact that Deku basically passed all for one on to Bakugo. Now, I'll save my rant for the review part. So, hmm. Either way, you know, they do that. Uh, QDBZ effects, like every other anime has done recently. Still, regardless, it looks fucking amazing, which I'm better have been better have been. So it was. And I liked that, at least. Whew. But, uh, Nine stops caring about his life. He basically just goes all out, despite knowing it'll pretty much nearly kill him, which technically it doesn't. Wink, wink. Uh, it still goes on for a bit, uh, but it looks amazing. Baku goes powered up with all for one. Uh, Deku goes into the form he used earlier in Season 4 with Eri, without Eri, which is also something we'll have to slightly mention, but then again, who knows. So they, they kick his ass, they, they, they kick it good, and he goes flying off, only to be uh, intercepted by Shigaraki, where no one notices, who, of course, kills him. He's like, you did good work. Now, it does get a little... There is a little contention, because a lot of the other ones get captured, and the fight's all over. All Might luckily gets to the island quick enough, and he sees... He hears from Deku that he made the decision to pass all for one. And this is a very, very touching scene. You guys gotta see it for yourself. I'm not gonna go too into it. But... Unf well, not really, unfortunately, just, you know, what had to happen was All for One realizes that All for One tra didn't fully transfer to Bakugo and said the transfer was cancelled when he fainted, and he also loses his memories of the transfer, too. Remember, Bakugo actually knows about All for One. I'm not entirely sure if that was already covered in the anime, but he does know in the manga, full on. Uh, shouldn't spoil anything more. That's just a slight thing. Like, you know, anime only as if it wasn't true, if he didn't know by season four, then it was pretty obvious, like ten minutes into the movie, that that was a spoiler, so sorry. But nonetheless, I will try my best to keep it to the end of the video. Or, what's left to the end of the video. Mm. Either way, it takes a lot longer for the movie to end. It's not a lot longer, it's actually pretty much done. 
They say bye to the kids. Not even bye bye. They kind of just dip while they're rebuilding. And then boom, that is the actual end of the movie. Yay. Now, it is time for the review portion in terms of how certain things were handled. Like I said, the final battle looked amazing, but it definitely had it definitely had some issues. Like it looked absolutely fucking amazing and the last match was a damn spectacular but the cons is that it really broke some lore to for the power to stay with Deku and Deku's power up that he did in the anime with Aerie is not something he should be able to do without Aerie literally so that was a bit much and he did use a hundred percent a little bit earlier that for a little bit longer than he should have been able to as well but overall, the series was a great experience. The movie was a great experience. They gave amazing fights. And used the individual members of Class 1A greatly. Shining some light on some of the lesser known members like Saro and Shoji. And if there are any showings left in your area. Because honestly, I didn't realize that there was showings left in even my area. I thought it was done last weekend when I was working selling tickets for the showing. And that kind of saddened me. I was also even more sad that I missed the dub, and I had to watch the sub. Now, I watch both in terms of just watching anime, but I do prefer to listen to my own language. I don't really care as much about the whole dub or something. With Simo dub stuff, it's a little bit easier nowadays. But more or less, if you want to be all the way caught up with an anime, you watch the sub. Of course, in my eyes, if you really want to be caught up, you read the manga, so... That's what I do. And then when it comes to the anime, I'm like, yeah, I really liked I want to see this thing animated. If there's nothing, really. But I will always re-watch it in dub when dub comes out. That's just how I do. Either way, like I was saying, if there are any showings left in the area, see it immediately. And definitely buy it on Blu-ray once it comes out. Like, seriously, it was a great movie. And I enjoyed the living fuck out of it. So, definitely see it. Now for the spoiler discussion for manga fans. Like I said, if you're an anime only, this is your time to cut out. I gave you like what my full real thoughts on the movie were, whether to see it or buy it, see it and buy it. So I hope you guys liked it and uh, feel free to look into the channel for more stuff. But on to the big spoilery discussion. So... There are some timeline difficulties, but we're going to get into that after I list the things that only us manga readers, or any anime only, if you really want to stick by, remember, this is spoilers. For us manga readers, these are the things that we would notice, in more or less chronological order. So at the start of the movie with the League of Villains, there is, you know, twice his quirk is used. And when I mean twice his quirk, I mean his evolved quirk. You know, after they confront Redestro and, you know, merge with his organization. Not gonna lie, I'm kind of half forgetting the name already. But still, there is that. And I will get more into that a little bit later. But nonetheless, they do have the upgraded quirk of twice. And it is freaking brilliant. The Doctor, also, he is revealed... Pretty sure there's a few arcs left before the anime even gets to him. Of course, if, as we all know, he was originally, you know, shown in episode and chapter one regardless. But with all the silhouette, you might not realize it's the same character, even though it's pretty much clearly him. A lot of people definitely realized it before. I always thought he looked familiar, but I didn't really pay too much attention to it. And it took me a long time to find the panel where he was introduced. Luckily, my friend Skep, who some of you may or may not know, another fellow YouTuber, check him out if you get the chance, uh, he gave me, a, well, bought me as a Christmas gift, uh, Volume 1 of My Year Academia, so I got to see it in full physical view. I love it. But, nonetheless, we move on. Despite having the evolved quirks, the League of Villains are in their old place that was weird that's that's 
it's a contradiction. That is a huge contradiction. Because now that they've merged with Redestro and his group, they have a much bigger, more extravagant hideout. That was actually like part of the arc before the merging that they're like, oh, we need a bigger hideout. We need more influence. And they're still in that same small hideout despite already having merged chronologically. So yeah, of course, movies aren't normally canon. And even though there is a lot of word of this, this is a huge contradiction that automatically means that it cannot fit perfectly. Regardless of what people say, it does not fit because of that. I move on. Hawks' undercover work is mentioned. Like I said, he doesn't really get undercover until after the merge, so that doesn't make fucking sense. Like I said, it doesn't fit, but do as you may. It is what it is. And there is a lot of uh, skepticism on that part. It's, it's just hinted at. But the last big manga spoiler is the one-for-all stuff. Luckily... Deku doesn't use Black Whip in the movie, but one, the vestiges of previous users whose faces have only just been shown in the manga have been shown in anime form now, with the two that have still been silhouetted off, still being silhouetted off, and when Nine tries to steal all for one, he immediately says, there are too many quirks in this boy's body, I can't steal it. So... Yay. I'm also going to not gonna lie. Initially, I thought that his quirk, that Steel's quirks, worked on blood types. But no, it was the cell activation quirk that worked on blood types. That was just a goof on my part when I was taking notes. Can't take perfect notes when you're constantly looking at subtitles. But luckily, my theater is a crap theater, and it does not have a lot of revenue coming in. So the theater was empty, and I work there, so... Having my phone to take notes was not that big of a deal. Yay. Still, I had to pay to see the movie. Fifteen bucks. Who'd have thought? Either way, yeah, that's honestly it for manga spoilers. And I really do want to get into certain parts of the One for All stuff, but I honestly don't. I've talked long enough, and honestly, my voice is a bit on the rough side. So I will leave you guys with... Thank you for coming. Thank you for watching all this way. If you have, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you guys are into gaming and stuff, check out the gaming channel. I won't be doing uh, the second My Hero game, unfortunately. I don't really want to do anime games until I have a full-on capture card. But if you guys want to support either channel, that helps. The closer I get to monetization, the closer I can get to really upgrading my materials so I can get a capture card but there, there's a few other things so I might get a capture card sooner than later even without that support either way please do support the channel and let me know if you guys want some more my hero stuff of course if I do it I will actually know names I learned a lot more through the movie but I do want to fill in those gaps so thank you guys for listening to me ramble although this was a little bit more scripted than my usual videos and have a great day. And like I said, if you haven't seen the movie already, I just spoiled the whole thing for you, but see it anyway, because that's how much of a spectacle it was. Despite my misgivings with certain story parts in the final battle, I still absolutely enjoyed it, even though it slightly took me out. <sighs> I will talk to you guys later. And uh, have a great day. And it's Friday, so TGIF. Now, GT the FO.